Okay, so now that we've talked about takeoff performance, let's just talk a little bit about landing performance. And I want to emphasize that landing performance is nearly the same process as we took for takeoff performance. In fact, we use all the same equations. There's just a few uh, minor tweaks that we have to do. So when we talk about landing, or when we, took, when we talked about takeoff, we talked about two different phases. There was an acceleration phase, uh, which can be broken up into two parts for a tail dragger aircraft. And then there was a rotation phase that ended with liftoff. And the, the acceleration phase took up the bulk of our ground roll, and the rotation phase was just the amount of time needed for the aircraft to input elevator deflection to increase lift enough to take off. In landing, we have a s sort of similar thing that happens. So if this is our airstrip, and we have an aircraft coming in, something like this. The aircraft's going to come in, and then at some point, the aircraft will land, will touch down. Okay, so let's draw that. Okay, so, so at some point the aircraft touches down, but then there's a length of time during which the pilot has to react. So the, the pilot has to recognize that the aircraft is on the ground and then react and engage the brakes, or in the case of a large aircraft, engage reverse thrust to slow the aircraft down. And this time that it takes for that to happen is what's known as the F, S sub F, or the free roll, the free roll phase, the free roll distance. Once brakes are engaged, the aircraft begins to slow down until it reaches the final velocity. So as the aircraft touches down, it, it touches down at a touchdown velocity, and it stays at that velocity until the brakes are engaged, and it slows down over the second phase, which is called S sub B, or the braking distance. So um, something to note is that the touchdown distance is generally about 1.15 or 15% above stall. Okay, and it needs to be greater than or equal to that. Now for military aircraft that gets down to about 10%, but for most aircraft it's above or equal to 15% of stall, or 15% higher than stall. The other thing to note is that when the aircraft is coming in, CL max is high because the aircraft is employing a lot of high lift devices, so that includes flaps, leading and trailing edge flaps, uh, and it may include some other things as well. So CL max is high. Okay, so if we look at the forces on the aircraft, once it hits the ground, it's going to look really familiar. Okay, so we draw our aircraft. on the ground okay so our forces are going to be as you'd expect we're going to have thrust we're going to have drag we're going to have lift acting straight up and we're going to have weight acting straight down and then we're also going to have friction, as we've talked about before. F sub R, weight, thrust, lift, drag. Now something to note is that our thrust is generally very small. Okay, so that the pilot, in the case where there is no reversed thrust, so for a smaller aircraft, thrust is at an idle setting, which is really almost like is, is negligible 
Now for a larger aircraft, this thrust might be negative if reverse thrust is, is employed. Okay. Now because the forces are all the same, we can use the same equation for distance traveled. So SI plus 1 minus SI equals W over G VI to VI plus 1 of V plus, excuse me, V minus V headwind divided by T minus D minus F sub R dV. Okay, so we can use the same equation. And our same assumption that thrust is parabolic with velocity can also be used. And so just to recap, that's T naught I plus T prime I times V plus T double prime I V squared. So we can use that and we can also use the same you know, equation for the drag, which includes ground effect and our force of friction. So we've gone over this before, they're functions of V squared. Uh, in the case of drag, it's also a function of velocity. So let me go ahead and write that in just to be, just for clarity. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and erase all these fun dots that I drew. Okay, so drag is a function of velocity and velocity squared. Of course, the friction, I believe, was just a function of velocity squared. At any rate, we can use these same approximations <clears throat> and we can use them to approximate the braking distance. Now something to note is when we're braking, when the brakes are engaged, and I mentioned this in an earlier video, the force of friction is mu r times weight minus lift. And mu r for, it changes for different surfaces. So for nice asphalt, it's about 0.04 and for like a grass field at 0.1. When brakes are engaged, we can get this coefficient as high as 0 0.4. Okay, so it gets quite a bit higher. And that's how we approximate the brakes. They essentially increase the friction. Okay, now once we have an approximation for SB, we already have an approximation uh, Sorry, I didn't mention this, but we, our, our free roll distance is just a reaction time thing. So SF is generally on the order of one to three seconds. Okay, so we don't do anything special. Oh, excuse me, that's TF. The reaction time TF is usually on the order of one to three seconds. And so SF is just VTD minus V headwind times TF. Okay, so now we have our approximation for SF. We have our approximation for SB. Nothing new here. Just a different application. And finally, putting those two together, we can get that the ground roll in landing is just equal to the sum of the two SF plus SB. And there we have it.